This week's show with Kath Janes is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. It's Nashville market time, and Kim will have all of the hottest charts from that annual cross-stitch festival. Contact her immediately to place your order so you don't miss out on your favorites. But don't just order the chart. Kim can help you put together full kits so you can get to stitching. Also, don't forget to check out the full collection of sassafras samplers at sassyjackstitchery.com and... While you're there, join the Cosmos Thread Club. It's a great way to build up a stash of beautiful cotton floss. If your significant other is wondering what to buy you for your birthday, Valentine's Day, or any other holiday, they can't go wrong with the Sassy Jack's gift certificate. Make Sassy Jack Stitchery your local needlework store by visiting the website at sassyjackstitchery.com. And now, on to our conversation with Kath Janes. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. And our artist this week, Kath Janes, Kraken Creations. Kath, welcome. Hello. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Beth. Now, you're in the U.K., which is always fun. We talk to a lot of people from the U.K. Where where are you located? I'm based in South Wales. Okay. So, um... Yes, uh, in in Wales, of course, South Wales, a very beautiful part of the world. A little bit drab today in February, but uh, otherwise lovely. Yeah, I've learned that. I've mentioned it several times. I've been to London twice, and you can just keep it. But uh, I have learned from others that once you get outside of London, that country is beautiful. (laughs) It's just gorgeous. Absolutely, yeah. You need to escape the, the big city and see some wonderful countryside. It's gorgeous. Yep. Yeah. On my bucket list. On the bucket list. Good. Glad to hear it. Yep. No, I. Uh, yeah. Same here. Yep. All right. Kraken Creations. We got. We got so many questions for you. We got first. We got to get Kraken Creations. We got to get that story out of the way. <laughs> um. Do you mean you you want to know about how that name came yeah, about? Very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh much. my giddy aunt. Uh, I've got the typical tale. I think a very. Uh, many stitches in that I didn't set out to create the business I've got now. It just kind of grew on its own without me really realising it. Um, And about 15 years ago, uh, I had my daughter and I became really ill with postnatal depression, which meant I had to give up my career as a journalist. And because I loved writing, uh, I just kind of kept going. I, I blogged, but it was quite an angry, shouty, feminist blog, which is ex- essentially who I am. So I called it the Kraken Wakes. And that's why I did lots of ranting online and I loved it. So when I started stitching back then, I was um, stitching with uh, you know, machine sewing, essentially. Uh, I started selling what I was making. The people loved what I was doing. And I thought, well, I'll incorporate the word Kraken into my new little business name. And Kraken Creations was born. And that's the way it's been for about seven years. But um, I absolutely hate it now, I must admit. So I'm in the process (laughs) of kind of changing it. Um, And it's one of those things where it kind of suited my business when I started. But now it just means nothing really in relation to my anatomical embroidery. So... um, it feels like this very slow process of metamorphosis, really. So I'm thinking of jettisoning in the name and just being Kath James Anatomical Embroiderer. So, yes, that's how the name came about. And uh, it's done its job, but now I just can't wait to get rid of it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and you're right. You're not the first one who has a, a business name that started somewhere else. And yeah, no, it's not the first time No. No, I know lots. There happens to lots of us. So um, at least I'm in good company. That's yes. something. Yeah. Okay. Well, if your new name is anywhere near creative as Kraken Creations, it'll be a winner. So <laughs> thank you. Because that is standout. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. Now, we're just got to dive right into this because, yeah. uh, you know, as we were talking beforehand, Beth homeschooled her kids. So she's chemistry degree, a lot of biology, was going to be pre-med. I'm a former biology and chemistry teacher. So when I see your work, all I see is my anatomy and physiology courses, Gray's Anatomy, 
uh, <laughs> it, what in heaven's name gets you to embroidering beautiful <laughs> but incredibly accurate uh, anatomical uh, pieces? I mean, you're basically a, a technical scientific illustrator with thread and needle, well, which is amazing. Oh, my word. What a wonderful, lovely thing for you to say. Thank you. Um, I'm strictly uh, amateur when it comes to anatomy. Um, I, uh, when I started stitching, machine stitching, uh, as I said earlier, I was recovering from postnatal depression, which had been quite severe. And in the process of recovery, I found that hand stitching was really therapeutic. It made me sit still, organise my thoughts, and I just loved it. And I really wanted to embroider but there, I never saw anything that I wanted that inspired me enough to kind of pick up a needle. And at the same time, um, I was going through a series of surgeries for my Bell's palsy, which is partial uh, facial paralysis. And recovering in hospital for one uh, long period after a particularly grim uh, surgery, I was quite bored. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if I put anatomy and embroidery together. And this was mainly because I'd seen so many images at that stage of the muscles of the face. And I realised the muscle fibres looked like straight stitches. And at first I thought, oh, that's a really weird idea. That's a stupid thing to do. But I just couldn't shake it off. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And when I got out of hospital, I had a little bash. And typically of me, as a woman with ADHD, I couldn't just tinker around the edges of this. I had to throw myself right in and have a go at it. <laughs> so, of course, the first thing I do, I mean, it can't be a simple anatomical piece. It has to be something from the pages of Grey's Anatomy. Uh, I started stitching the muscles of the face. And um, during one uh, outpatient's appointment with my surgeon, I showed him what I was doing. And his reaction was absolutely staggering. He jumped out of his seat. He uh, became really excited. He looked at the embroidery, which I had with me. He immediately said, the moment you finish this, I want to buy it off you. And his reaction was just I, I, staggering. It was inspiring and exciting. And it made me realise perhaps I was onto something. And that's essentially where it started. And his reaction made me realise perhaps this isn't as weird as I thought it might be. Uh, <laughs> and I kind of went from there. I started like experimenting, looking at other things I wanted to do. Very, very slowly started showing people online because some reactions I've had to my work have been very interesting indeed. Some people think I'm very weird and very creepy. But luckily... Uh, I had enough good reactions to kind of keep going and start showing people online. And it grew from there. So, um, yeah, it's kind of snowballed, really. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that I'd go weird and creepy. I think it's amazing stuff. I mean, it's it's so accurate and, and beautifully done. I, uh, Thank you. And, and I, I, I'm, as you're telling that, I'm having visions of you sitting in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> And people trying to look but not look as you're stitching a face. Right. Oh, it's fascinating. You know what? One of the things I used to do a lot was take my embroidery to public places. When I say public places, you know, coffee shops, so I could get away from my little sewing shed. I don't do it so much anymore because I'm so busy. But the reactions of other people were always fantastic. Some people would come and look. And then they would physically back away from me when they saw what I was doing because they assumed as an embroiderer, I was doing much more kind of pretty traditional images. Right. Other people would see my work and become so excited. And um, there was this one particular moment um, about five or six years ago, and I was stitching the, uh, the uterus, fallopian tubes and ovaries. And it was in a really quiet kind of cafe in a supermarket, not far from closing time. And there were a group of women just across the way, five or six of them doing their kind of stitch and ditch thing. Um, all of them, you know, perhaps say 70s, 80s, even 90s. And I could see them all looking and whispering to each other. And one of them came over, plucked up the courage and came over and said, can you just show me what you're doing? And I showed her and 
It turns out she was in her 80s, she had two children, and she had no idea what her uterus or ovaries or fallopian tubes looked like. And oh. I explained to her what I was stitching. And the the light bulb that went off over her head was just absolutely staggering. And that was just such a wonderful moment where, you know, I, I was creating something which I was really proud of, and it was having this direct personal impact on somebody else. And that was another real kind of growth moment where I thought, yes, there are people who look at me like I'm a grave robber, but then there are way more people who think this is a great thing to do. So again, that kind of spurred me on, really. So yes, people's reactions are always fascinating. They're never blah. They're never somewhere in the middle. They're always, you know, uh, oh my God, she's going to kill me and dissect me, or oh my God, I think this is wonderful. So um, that's a really fun part of the whole thing, I think. <laughs> I, I know I showed your um, images to my husband, um, and he was like, "That is so cool." He's she's like, he's like, and looking at the dimensions, how you got it, it, it looks more three D than just oh, like a flat gosh. image, which you know I love. I'm just ready to go. I want to go. I want to touch them. And I know you're not supposed to touch them, but you know that's my idea. <laughs> like, how did she do that? And I'm, I want to kind of dissecting. So, so what are your favorite stitches to use on your pieces? Oh, you know what? One of the big uh, myths I think about my work is that the stitches are really complex and they're just not. I'm, I often describe myself as somebody who just stabs fabric until an image appears. So the stitches I use, um, straight stitches, French knots, split stitches and some couching and that's it. Um, and what I love about what I do is how stitches are so good at replicating uh, anatomical structures. So really long straight stitches are great for muscle fibers uh mm. french knots are great for fat because fat is quite bobbly on the human body and for glands so they're really quite simple stitches stitches anyone can do but i think it's kind of how they're applied um i often work in single strands after i've blocked in different areas of color on my pieces and the stitches can get absolutely tiny I mean, to the point I feel I need to slap my own face and say, just stop. Uh, I've already mentioned um, that I'm a woman with ADHD and I, I've got this real hyper focus, which can be really challenging to live with. But in terms of my stitching, it's exactly what I need. I kind of keep falling down that rabbit hole of trying to absolutely nail a structure until I'm working in single strands on two millimeter stitches just to kind of create the look that I want. So um, there, there are times I say to my husband, you know, at some point you're going to have to come in to my sewing shed and kind of shake me out of this rabbit hole I'm falling down. So uh, I guess at least I'm making the ADHD work for me, really. But I do enjoy it, and I do love that when I step back at the end of that, there's a piece on the canvas that I'm really proud of. So it's, it's worth the, the, the obsessive thinking for days on end. Well, that's what I'm telling my therapist anyway. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did this all evolve? Uh, I mean, you obviously, you, I mean, you, you tell the story about um, having surgery and, and studying and realizing it can be a a, a piece of needlework, but mm. there's there's got to be quite a process to get to the point where you're at today in terms of figuring out colors and creating <laughs> depth and uh, a lot of, I'm sure, a ton of failures in pulling threads back out because it just wasn't looking oh. right. Because uh, the look you get is just so accurate. It's um... oh, thank you. Um, so yes, when uh, I got when I first started stitching anatomy, uh, uh, when I had my daughter 15 years ago, I had really severe postnatal depression. And it pretty much raised my brain to the ground, as I call it. There was not much left. Um, and I didn't function at all, really, for about two years. But when I started to recover, I found my brain naturally gravitating towards the things I loved when I was a child and a teenager. And one of those things was anatomy. In fact, I remember as a child, my mother cooking a chicken on Sundays and she'd pull the giblets out of the chicken and I would always dissect them. I didn't even know what they were, but that was what I naturally wanted to do. With a crappy old kitchen knife and my mother looking at me like I was insane. I didn't know what they were, but I just felt 
the need to do it. So um, when I started recovering from the postnatal depression and I started thinking about anatomical embroidery and I realised it was something I wanted to do, it, it felt like a natural part of the process to start thinking about dissecting again. Now, of course, I can't dissect humans, that's illegal. Uh, but one of the things I do to research the pieces I stitch is to dissect uh, animal specimens, which can be sent uh, here in the UK anyway to students through the post. And you can get a range of different organs. Uh, and doing that is quite shocking to some people. But to me, it's a perfectly normal part of the process where because my art relies so much on textures, there's only so far photos and books can take me until I actually need to touch the things I want to stitch in much the same way as if you want to stitch, say, uh, flowers. You know, you want to hold them in your hand, see the way the light shines off them, feel whether they're kind of smooth or textured in some way. And that's exactly the same with human anatomy. So that's a really key part of the process. I've got loads of books, um, loads of medical illustrations. I've got a really great book, which is called a, a Photographic Dissector, lots of images of a human dissection. And they are great, but I really need to get my hands inside, literally, some organs to kind of inform what I do. Most recently, um, I've had, I've dissected half a pig's head. The other half is currently in my freezer. And what, what's amazing about dissections is that it doesn't matter how much I think I already know, a dissection will always tell me so much more. They are, it's just a fantastic way to learn about anatomy. And everything I learn, I try to put right into my embroideries. It's never, ever wasted. So, um, yeah, that's one of the most fun parts, I think, of uh, what I do, that level of detail in terms of researching my pieces. Yeah, you know, that is so true about dissection. I, I haven't taught in a long time, but I assume anymore that dis dissections are just online on a screen. I, I don't know if they actually dissect the animals anymore, but uh, um, I had a tussle when I was teaching with a school board member whose daughter, of course, he was a school board member because his daughter was in high school. And then, you know, that, that was the extent of his interest. But um, she wanted to become a nurse and refused to dissect a frog. And, oh. And, you know, my reaction was, wait a minute, you, you, you're you going to see far worse as a nurse than, than, a, yes. than a preserved frog. And, and right. I wouldn't let her off the hook because uh, oh. I didn't make her do the actual cutting. I said, you can observe that part. But you got to mm. be there because you have to see how these pieces all fit together in yes. the, the proportions and how they lay on each other. And you're not going to get yes. that off a screen. I, I just never believe no. that. No, you're not. No. And, and I even made my daughter, who didn't want to do science, she was not science interested at all. And I said, that's the one thing you have to do. You have to do this dissection. And actually, mm -hmm. we have a very funny video of her dissecting the frog finally. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, because you, you, you need to. How else will you know how it works, how the those... Yes. It's just, it's fascinating, you know, um, any, my kids always like doing dissection though. Um, we had like, um, you could get the owl pellets and open those up yes. and then see what they ate. Yeah. We did oh. those when the kids were young and, and it was fascinating to see what they would find and find the tiny skulls of the mice or whatever. Oh. And, but how will you know, unless you look at it and you touch it and yes. you open that up, it's just fascinating stuff. Um, it's interesting you say that. Recently um, on Instagram, I've got a really active Instagram account. All my followers come from there. I recently shared images of my uh, dissection of half a pig's head and it absolutely blew up. There were <laughs> so many people saying this is fascinating. This is wonderful. What a great opportunity. But then there were others who just, well, well, it was as if I was the devil incarnate. <laughs> and I have never seen such vitriol. It was absolutely stunning. Calling me a monster, telling me I was evil. Um, one woman wanting to know when I was going to kill a pregnant human so I could dissect oh. her to do my next uh, piece. Oh, come on. It was absolutely stunning. I know, it was absolutely stunning. And I was explaining to them, 
it's what's important to medical illustration is, amongst many other things, is accuracy. And you need to do your own research. You can't keep relying on the research of others, not just because that's unethical, but it's also stealing. I mean, other medical illustrators have done all this hard work and I can't go stealing that from them. And the, the, these people arguing with me kept saying, but yeah, we'll just steal the work. It's fine, just copy others. And it was staggering that they thought that would be an OK thing to do. So I absolutely fight the corner of if you're interested in anatomy, um, you want to know about anatomy, you just have to get your hands dirty and get your hands in there because it's the only the best way to learn. And I think, as you said then, Gary, opening up um, whatever specimen you've got to see, you know, the textures, how the, the anatomical structures lie against each other, um, mm. how the light shines from them, any little weird kinks and curves that you haven't seen on any other illustration. It's all so informative, just the scale of everything. Yeah, you just, um, it's impossible, I think, to really work with anatomy and not actually do any dissecting. Yeah, you, right. yeah, you, you have to. And, and that's the, the other part is when you do it, you also realize how connected we all are as animals. And oh, yes. all the similarities, I, I you know, always stuck with me, even from yeah. my own high school dissections, and then all the way through teaching and and college. Mm. How connect? I mean, just the similarities are are just mind blowing, and unless you get in there and and see that, you just never put it together. You know, it's uh, people often say to me things like, you know, why don't you just do landscapes? And I'll say, well, the human body is a landscape. The inside of the human body is, the, to me, the most fascinating landscape of all. And when you look at an anatomical structure, it, uh, certainly with the things I dissect, I never see something completely strange. It's always something I could see inside myself, perhaps a little bit different or bigger or a different shape. Or, But, you know, recently when I, dis I dissected half a pig's head, the brain was just a thing of absolute wonder and to know that was inside my body you know without the little piggy memories obviously but <laughs> to know that was in my body was just like whoa and you're looking at another an animal structure but really we're looking at ourselves and our lives and what makes us able to stand up and shout at somebody on the internet or to appreciate a piece of art that's what we're looking at it's just right. a, a wondrous thing, and it's, it's it's always such an absolute honour to be able to look inside any creature to look at the anatomy. That never fails. The honour of that never fails. I, I never miss that. It's always just I appreciate it so much. Um, it's just never fails to amaze me. Yeah. <laughs> and you think of uh, the. I keep on thinking of the, the slices of like the human skin. You know, you, it, to me, that's always been fascinating, you know, how, you know, got things, you know, your, um, the follicles and the layers of the epidermis, that, that would be, you just got me thinking, I was like, oh, that would be really interesting to illustrate that. And yeah, it is. And th th I've, I've done um, a piece of the skin previously. And what's amazing is the tiniest portion of skin, it's got so much in it. Yes. So yes. many structures. <laughs> it's boggling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just fascinating to and and how can that be it's you have to you're right you have to do dissection how will you know unless you see it yourself yes absolutely and as i said because i work uh because what i do involves textures so much and I, I pick the stitches i use uh to replicate the structures i've seen i really do need to know what they feel like there's only so far a photograph or an illustration can take me i need to feel like the fat between my fingers or the smoothness of the surface of the liver, or whatever it is I'm working on, that the touch of something will take me so much further than a photograph ever could. Yeah, see, that's right. the, that's it right there. That is it right there, is the the textures, and mm. you you really realize that the different organs are truly different kinds of tissue put together yes. differently to to uh, to function differently, and yeah, it it's. I mean, I can I can just see you going through a dissection and your hand just feeling the various tissues and and 
either writing down or mentally noting how you might stitch that. I can see that happening. Yes. Yeah. It's a great joy. It's a great joy. As, as I said, it's always an honor. It doesn't matter how anonymous the uh, the specimen is that I've been sent. You know, when I did the pig's head a couple of weeks ago, when I finished with that, I, I buried it in the garden because the soil will clean it up and I can keep the bones. And you, it sounds really weird. You have no idea how much I've appreciated that pig. And I thought about what the pig was doing before it came to me. And you know how it deserves to be treated really well post dissection uh, and looked after and when its skull is cleaned up to be in my shed here where I can look at it and just keep loving it so it's it's I think even if I couldn't embroider anymore I would still want to dissect things <laughs> yeah there's that element of respect when when I was in college we were privileged and I I mean privileged to see a cadaver Oh, and lovely. A lady, you know, a lady had donated her body. And, of course, we're, we're in this room with you know, all the stainless steel and absolute mm -hmm. respect. I'll never forget how the class approach changed when we walked in there. Just utter respect. But yeah. the most fascinating class I think I had my entire time because you mm -hmm. got to see what you know, we all got to see what we're like inside. And uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And we couldn't get very close. You know, they, I mean, we, we had to stand back and, and uh, uh, there was a, a million rules and things to, you know, to make sure that it was done properly. But, oh, you know, even, even the class clowns completely changed their, <laughs> you know, their, because, right. you know, it, you're right. It's an honor and uh, to be able to look at something like that and, and study it, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's much more different. People that that haven't done it, you don't, you just don't appreciate what's uh, what goes in there. Yeah, no, it's, it's quite a moment, isn't it, to be faced with something like that. Some people can go all their lives without being faced with, I guess, that like brutal edge of humanity. Really, to see somebody who's no longer alive and they're right there in front of you and to, to look ins inside them is to look inside yourself and it's to look inside humans going back as far as they've ever gone it's it's just a fascinating wonderful thing to do and I think it's almost impossible to leave an experience like that behind you you kind of carry something of it with you really don't you oh yeah oh I mean that that today some I don't know what Fifty years later, it is still as vivid as as anything in my life. Uh, I mean, I it just yeah, it really has an impact on you, and and it's a respectful thing without a question. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I quite so, agree. So, so as, as you're looking you know, as you're looking at illustrations and then doing dissections, take us through that mental process of translating what you're seeing with your eyes to needle and thread. Are you are in, in, in how you get the colors? Take us through that. Um, one of the things I'm uh, this is a, something I kind of just like mentally go over before each piece is how much I want to do a piece that is uh, true to the colors you'd see if you opened up a human body, um, and how much I want to use false color. Now, false color is used quite a lot in medical illustrations because uh, it, it allows students to look at an illustration and clearly see the different structures. So blues and reds for blood vessels, for example, yellow for nerves. That's not at all what the colours are inside the human body. But when you look on an illustration, you can see exactly the pathways and you can learn about the body. So um, I often resort, well, I always pretty much now resort to uh, false colour because otherwise, it'd be quite difficult to do an anatomical structure um, with all just the same kind of colour on it, the same perhaps dirty kind of pink colour if it's particularly healthy. I, I think it gives it more interest to mix it up, really. That's always a process of experimentation. I've got a set palette of shades, which I tend to start with and I'll often amend. So um, I've got a box of colours where um, the, the, I always tend to go towards the same ones for muscles, the same ones for blood vessels. I try and change them up, perhaps give them a more contemporary twist. 
But the whole process leading up to me putting a needle in fabric can take, it always takes so much longer than I think it's going to, because I do so much research. Um, sometimes I'll do a dissection if I can. If I can't do that, it will be about hours and hours of poring over illustrations and photographs, looking online, finding YouTube videos of dissections if I can. And then because I'm not a professional um, anatomist, I really have to kind of cobble together everything I've learned through that research to put on paper exactly what I want to stitch. And that's quite a slow process as well. I'm not, a, I would say I'm not a brilliant sketcher, so that can take quite a lot of time, but I do pour over that to get it absolutely right before um, I get it down on the calico. And when I, I, I've showed people my sketches a few times on Instagram, and I always laugh. They look like the sort of thing a toddler would have done with a crayon. They are really kind of basic, a little bit shonky outlines. I've used really mad primary colours to block things out. But that tends to be all I need to get the image down on the calico. And then after that, I kind of just stitch it together as I'm going along. It's a really, really slow process. Um, some pieces will take oh, many hours. Um, I've had a couple take up to 100 hours. Uh, because it's extremely slow work, but I think it makes it worth it, really. So the process, sorry if, if I'm rambling here, the process from the, the very start when I've decided what I want to stitch to when I actually put the last stitch in. Yes, there's a massive amount of embroidery in there. But that's just not the start of the process. The the pouring over the, the design, the anatomical shapes, the colours, the research, that is a big chunk of time as well. So from one end to the other, it's it's quite a project, really. Yeah. So your your illustrations then, it sounds like, are just a kind of block art to frame the yeah. thing. And then in your head, you see what those areas are going to be in, in terms of threads and stitches. Yes, that's right. Um, because uh, when I do a dissection, I take lots and lots of photos, lots of photos, so I can always refer back to those. One of the things I've done in the past, uh, which, again, can look a little bit weird, is try to create almost my own anatomical structures, because I like to see the way the light will play off a shape. So, for example, um, I did one piece of blood cells flying through... Uh, a blood vessel and so I got um, the inner the cardboard inner tube from uh, a roll of toilet tissue and I cut a segment from that and I kind of shaded a little bit of it and I held it in the light so I could see how the light would fall on it um, I did a part uh, I stitched a piece of the brain and uh, a part of that structure look looked almost like an egg so I got an egg I drew some things on that the way I thought the stitches might lie on the fabric. I held that in the light to see how that would work. So I try and get around uh, these like complexities a bit like that, really. Um, years and years ago, I used to paint um, acrylics, acrylic paint. And I've realised recently that I actually stitch in the way I used to lay acrylic paint on a canvas, where I start with blocking out colour and shapes and then I just keep working on it and resolving an area until it looks right. And I find that I do that with my embroidery. I'll block in a structure, say a blood vessel, in a, a medium shade of red that I want to use. And then I just keep going over and over it with different shades until I start getting that 3D look and the shape on it. And I modify my stitches and how many strands I'm using per stitch. And it kind of slowly appears over time as if the as if the fog is starting to clear really across the fabric so that's how i tend to do things there it is right there i knew there was a place where <laughs> you transition from uh the science to the art uh, yes there had there had yes. to be because because your your work is there's there's so much art in your work so there is an art background and an appreciation for how to create depth in two dimensions. And so you have all of that. And then, okay, yep, all right. <laughs> it's, 
it's interesting again is that as I said when I was at school I absolutely failed art and I think I wasn't inspired by any of the subjects we did I didn't and I think it was one of those things where somebody must have said to me when I was young that I was not good at art and then I just decided well that's it then I'm not good at art and I think it was only when I got to anatomy um as an embroiderer that that inspired me and previously doing acrylic painting it, I didn't do that for long but um it was enough to kind of inspire me to want to get more into art doing something artistic and enough to make me realize well actually I'm not absolutely useless at art I just need to find something that interests me so much that I want to get it right and as I said, now mo most recently I look at my embroidery and I've started to join the dots from that to when I used to do some work in acrylics. And I can see how that kind of process has grown from there, really. Yeah. <laughs> so much fun. So much fun. And obviously what you do works because uh, talk about uh, the, the awards you've received from the Institute of Med Medical Illustrators, you know, cause that's always the, the, the next question with this kind of stuff is how does, what reaction do you get from the people who, the professionals who live this stuff every day, you know, do they relate to it or is it just some abstract thing to them? And clearly you connected there. Yeah. They, uh, Oh, my days. I, I, I'd be brutally honest. Um, I've got a almost terminal case of imposter syndrome when it comes to things like this. <laughs> I, I mean, absolutely, uh, brutally so. And there's no greater feeling than when somebody who knows the way around the human body, a surgeon or a clinician of some sort, they see one of my pieces and they love it because they love the art of it and they love the accuracy of it. And, that is just absolutely staggering to me. The amount of research I put into my pieces, it's all about accuracy. But there's always this little, you know, devil voice in the back of my head saying, you know, what if you forgot about that nerve? Perhaps you did that brain wrong. Or that might look a bit, you know, useless. Or, And I've always got that in the back of my head. So when a professional comes to me and says, that's absolutely perfect, an anatomical expert, it's just the most mind-boggling thing to hear. And the... It's really interesting with the Institute of Medical Illustrators. Um, I show everyone my work on Instagram all the time. That's like my most busy social media platform. And the editor of uh, the Journal of Visual Communication in Medicine got in touch with me, I think it was in 2001, and said, uh, I've seen your work, I love it. Can I put it in the journal? And the journal is produced by the Institute of Medical Illustrators. And I was absolutely astounded. I was like, are you sure? Me? You mean me? Wait, Whoa. they came to you and asked if they yes. could use yours? Oh, wow. What an honor. Yeah. I, mean, it was absolutely, I mean, it's nearly two years on. And I was still like, whoa, did I dream that? And they featured my pieces in the magazine. And that gave me the confidence to apply um so I'm now an affiliate member of uh, the Institute. And then that gave me the confidence to submit some of my work for the awards last year. And I got those five bronzes. And that's now given me the confidence to apply for the World um, Illustration Awards. And I'll apply to the Institute Awards again this year. And there's all these kind of little stepping stones where I feel sometimes like, uh, like a child kind of, showing her parents a drawing and hoping her parents are going to say, oh, that's good. And I'm nearly 52 and I'm now doing that with the kind of medical establishment. So I'm, <laughs> I'm tentatively holding out a, a design and saying, do you think it's okay? Mm -hmm. And then when they say, oh God, yes, it's great. I'm like, yay. It's <laughs> it's like almost a childlike feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. So it's, a, it's really exciting to find that place where I meet... Uh, the the kind of border almost between the science and the art yeah. and the people out there who will appreciate that i didn't even know they existed when i started doing this uh but that they do is what kind of keeps me going sometimes it's amazing wow <laughs> yeah, that is great and, and it's great that you're getting that affirmation from you know people who know you know who do the dissections or yeah it's fantastic yeah, it's the best praise. It's the best praise I could have. You know, art is always, 
you know, in the eye of the beholder, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? But when it comes to the accuracy, when people say, yeah, that's right, that's kind of a black and white thing, really, and that's just such a thrill. All right, take us through the mechanics of it. Is it a standard uh, embro surface embroidery setup, uh, hoop, calico, uh, cotton floss, silk? What uh, do, you, do you do anything different than any other surface embroiderer? No, I don't think I do. Yeah. I tell you what, um, one of the things I've learned, I used to suffer awfully from comparisonitis. I'd look at other embroiderers and be, oh, I can't be like them. I could never be like them. Well, they're so much better than me. And one of the things I've learned to do with my anatomical embroidery, because it is such a weird kind of niche, is to stop looking at other embroiderers. Um, so when I listened uh, recently to a few of your podcasts, that was like one of the rare times I ever really see what other people are doing because I'm scared that that little devil voice in my head will say, oh, you see, you're not good enough. So interestingly, um, I often don't know if the way I'm doing things is in quotation marks, right or wrong. I'm just doing it my way and it's working. But yeah, it is a standard setup. Um, I usually, my biggest pieces are usually on a nine inch hoop, load them up with calico, um, that's been strengthened, of course, with interfacing and get my design on there and just go from there. And usually I work with um, stranded DMC thread, uh, three strands usually per stitch to block in colour. And then as I'm working, I'll increasingly go down to a single strand to get the, the surfaces as fine and as smooth and as resolved as I can. So there's nothing particularly weird or complicated or new there but there is a, a worrying level of tenacity and determination where uh sometimes i think I, I do need to slap myself across the face and say okay you need to back off now <laughs> <laughs> well you've just given us our new word comparisonitis i love it <laughs> yeah yes yes I, I suffer from that one i just uh yeah and it's bad it's bad <laughs> yeah it's, it's yeah. really tough, isn't it? I, I look on um, the internet sometimes on Instagram, other embroiderers, but that'll be very rarely. And it'll be when I've mentally shored myself up to have enough self-belief that seeing them doesn't eat away my my own work. But it is really difficult. It, and, and I think it's so easy on social media. We're assailed all the time by all these amazing pieces of art. And for me, certainly, it's easy for me to say I, I'm not good enough, but um, I'm learning slowly to not do that. So it can be done. There is hope, Beth. Mm. <laughs> oh, good, good, because I, I, I was doing it. I was doing it last night. I was like, oh, mine isn't as good as yours. And I'm like, oh, OK, wait, wait, <laughs> wait. <No. laughs> right. I'm not having that talk. Do you think that doing your embroidery has um, helped you with your AD? ADHD and your um, even you know with depression. That's an interesting question. Let me think. I the the hyper focus of my ADHD is really well employed with what I do. I don't think I could ever create these images if I just didn't fall down that rabbit hole. Um, and I stay in that rabbit hole until I put the final stitch in, and then it's almost like I wake up like some sort of weird sleeping beauty and there's a piece of art on the calico. So I couldn't do it without that. I think the ADHD is a greater challenge where it comes to running my business because uh, um, even though I run my business well, I think, there are there's often overwhelm, uh, tears, there's a lot of struggle. One of the problems I have with ADHD, well, most women with ADHD have, is the ability to organise and prioritise, um, to work through brain fog and memory loss. So I guess the biggest struggle I have really is managing the business. If all I could do was uh, embroider, I'd be absolutely fine. But uh, nobody's going to buy my work unless I do all the business stuff around it. And that's where the ADHD struggle comes in. And interestingly, while um, hand stitching has been brilliant in the past for my mental state, this last year, I think, has been really difficult. I um, About a year ago on Instagram, one of my reels went viral, which, you know, was really exciting. And it's 
the gold standard for lots of people. Everyone's itching to have their reels go viral on Instagram so everyone can see their work. And it was quite amazing in terms of the amount of exposure I had. And it was amazing to have so many commissions as well. But one of the difficult things I found was I had so many commissions, I was on a perpetual deadline to stitch something so I could stitch the next thing and the next thing. And that's when the almost um, therapeutic part of embroidery, that just kind of evaporated because I was right. permanently in like a blind panic trying to get things stitched. Uh, so this... I made a big decision then at the end of last year because it had been so difficult and so stressful that uh, I made a decision that from now on I will take the occasional commission but I'll just create my own art instead um, and sell that as prints and put my designs on products and whatnot um, and I will take big commissions if anyone is willing to pay of course but otherwise I really need the time to go back to stitching pieces where there are no deadlines there is no pressure i'm not stitching a spleen in a for example in a slightly weird color because that's what's been asked of me i will do the pieces that i absolutely think are the things i want to do that they look as good as i want them to and there's nobody cracking a whip over my head and since i've been doing that i have that found it much more kind of therapeutic and almost meditative again so i think i'm on the right track there yeah. So it, yeah. Does, sorry, go on. I, I was going to say I, that that sounds terrible to have to always be producing it, and then it's no longer art. It's like they're trying to make you into a machine, yes. like your printing press that you know, yes. or you know, a sewing machine. It just it's yeah. not the same, and that's not you're not doing that. You're making art. Yes, and it's really interesting, isn't it? That uh, I think somehow or, or another, I found myself being commercial more than artistic. And the, the viral reel last year was a blessing and a curse in that it, it made me so much more kind of commercial, I guess, in that I had all these deadlines and I had to create all these pieces. But it also coming, made me really crystallise the way I want to move forward. And that was really kind of fascinating and it was a lot to get my head around. And I, I've been going through this kind of process, I guess, in the last three months where I've started to call myself an artist. And that's taken a massive uh, emotional and personal shift in how I see myself and what I do. Often people will have called me an artist in the past. And in my head, I'm silently saying, oh, don't be silly. I'm not an artist. Oh, that's ridiculous. And. I, I sometimes say that the word artist has felt like marbles in my mouth. It's like I should, I'm not the sort of person who says that word. I'm not that kind of person. And I, I'm getting to a point, well, I am now at a point where I think, well, no, I am an artist. And that's been a really interesting process going from being somebody who creates things kind of almost commercially to somebody who just creates art. So that's been a really interesting kind of journey to go on, really. Yeah, that's um, yeah. That, that whole "are you an artist?" question comes up all the time, and uh, and then when it when it's needle and thread, of course, then that's woman's work, so that can't be art. And uh, right, yeah, I mean, yeah, and and it, I can see the struggle. I mean, I appreciate the struggle that we you you would go through because yeah, it is art, and you are an artist, and uh, just because it's needle and thread doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, my my family is, you know, we've come from uh, we're a working class family and in South Wales. My family all kind of worked down the mines. Um, there's been a lot of poverty in the past and that's kind of ingrained into me one way or another because it just is this family law. You know, um, I, I remember my grandfather having coal dust on his skin. I remember the poverty. And then there's this shift where I decide I'm going to be an artist. And that feels like oh, I've gone through so many emotions about, is that some sort of betrayal? Is that an idea above my station, whatever the hell my station is? <laughs> that whole kind of process has been really kind of complex. And there's still days when I fight with it, when I'm, I'm overwhelmed and I still think I can't, I'm not an artist. I should just go back to wherever I think I should be. 
but luckily the steps forwards are greater than the steps back so i've just got to keep going really haven't i <laughs> yep. yes yes absolutely is what you do uh of uh, all day thing i mean do you have a, a pattern do you get up in the morning and say you know i'm gonna do business stuff be first to get it out of the way and then i'm gonna stitch how do you go about that or do, is it uh, do you just fit oh, it into your, your life? I mean, you have a child and a husband and a home and yes. all those other things. I'll tell you when I find out. I think that's probably okay. the best answer. <laughs> it's something I've always struggled with. I've always struggled with it. And um, going back to what I've just said about being an artist and calling myself that, uh, am I worthy of that? And all these questions, I increasingly find myself doing more business admin than art and that is something I'm actually fighting against and turning around now um, and I've always struggled with a balance between stitching and the admin by admin I mean everything from you know social media planning to uh, creating prints or new products or sending them to people doing all the emails there's never the ba I've never really got the balance quite right, and the start of this year particularly was quite difficult. I seemed to go for several weeks from New Year where I barely picked up a needle, and I realised that absolutely had to change. And so that's what I'm doing at the moment, really. This last couple of weeks, I've really got my head around that. One of the issues with ADHD is the inability to prioritise. So if there are, say, 20 things I've written on the to-do list. I think I need to do them all right now, all brilliantly. Uh, I, I can't kind of pull them apart and decide which I need to do now and which I want to do later. I'm starting to get my head around that slowly. So the idea now is certainly um, the stitching is what I do, say, 80% of the time. Whatever time I've got left after that, I do on whatever admin I feel I need to do. Um, I do this as a full time job, so I've got real structure, you know, um, get up, uh, get my kids to school, have a bit of time to myself, half an hour to myself, go in my shed, uh, stitch till kind of five or well, stitch or work till five o'clock um, and then go back into the house. And I I think that structure um, is really kind of helpful. Um, I'm quite driven anyway, and I'm happy kind of sitting inside that structure. Sometimes I think it becomes a bit of a cage so I'm trying to break out of that those boundaries a little bit as well because working alone in a shed while that's something I've chosen to do and I absolutely adore it it's also a kind of artistic vacuum I'm not mixing with anyone else I'm not necessarily getting artistic input from anywhere so I really do need to kind of shift those rules I've created about nine to five and leave the shed behind and go and look at some other art and go and meet some artists so it's always something that's shifting and changing. I'm always fighting with. So um, one day I will nail it. Um, I really don't know when, but I'm trying. <laughs> so I've got to ask you then, do you go like, um, I know other artists in other mediums um, go to art museums to find mm -hmm. inspiration, even if, you know, you know, they'll go and see sculpture, even though they're mixed media artists or whatever. Do you find mm -hmm. like maybe going to a science museum inspires you or or is it just being out in nature that inspires you and gets you um, rejuvenates those creative juices yes it's um I'll take science wherever I can find it I find the best thing for me is uh, mental space one of the things I do I, I try to do cardio exercise every day and one of my favorite forms is walking on the hills around where I live and it's not kind of gentle ambling. It's, uh, I suspect, really silly levels of pushing myself to the edge of exhaustion. <laughs> where I love walking up really steep hills as fast as I can until I'm sweating, a bit giddy, think I might be sick. It sounds, it's always punishing. But I absolutely love it. And where I walk is absolutely dead quiet. There isn't a soul. There's just nobody around. There are a few sheep, a few cows. And I find that level of exertion kind of helps me shake off uh, some of the problems ADHD raises in my head and allows my brain to breathe. And that's when I'll get ideas. Um, hospitals, I love. 
uh, that sounds really weird. I've been in hospital uh, quite routinely for various reasons. And, you know, a lot of people are terrified about going into hospital and I get quite excited about it. And I know that sounds so <laughs> weird. Uh, when I was, when I had, well, I've still got my Bell's palsy, of course, but I needed several surgeries for that. And one of them failed spectacularly. So I was quite ill and I was just so excited to go back into theatre I got them to show me around before they knocked me out. I asked them loads of questions. Whenever I go to outpatients appointments now, you know, I grill everyone I can get my hands on. I recently went to um, a department for prosthetics because uh, of a small surgery I need to have done on one of my eyes. And I was just beside myself. I was in the waiting room and they had this wonderful glass cabinet of pathetic fingers, ears, eyes, noses. Well, I was just out of my mind with excitement. And I went into my appointment and I grilled them and grilled them about what they do and how they do it and how they create the art. And I didn't really ask any questions about my own health or my eye or what was going to happen. I just cared about what they did. <laughs> so things like that get me so excited. And um, I'm trying to join the library at the moment at my old university uh, uh, so I can access uh, all the the medical books they've got there. There's a huge uh, medical teaching hospital and I've been quite gutted to find out that I can join the library but I cannot access anything medical for some weird reason I can't understand. But I'm, I'm bloody determined if I have to, I don't know, disguise myself as a doctor <laughs> to get in there, that's oh. what I'll do. So, yes, it's weird. I find kind of inspiration in not the usual places, really. <laughs> oh, no, no, that makes sense. It makes sense for what you do for your art, that that's what inspires you to. Yes. Uh, Even in the supermarket. Even in the supermarket, I recently found some lamb's hearts in uh, one of the aisles of the supermarket and became very excited. So um, it kind of, it comes out of nowhere, really. What inspires me, it's all... <laughs> quite weird so it's anatomy really and brain space space to kind of mental space to percolate the ideas that have been building up in my head they are the things that work for me mm. meat markets mm -hmm. like a playground for calf <laughs> <laughs> take me to an abattoir and i'll be a happy woman <laughs> mm. well, material. now i now i at least know who it is that makes my doctor late all the time so that's good <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, well Kat thanks so much this has just been oh, boy, this has been special to be able to talk to you yep. and learn all this tremendous art tremendous uh, story thanks for making the time with us no thank you for inviting me I hope um, I said something interesting and useful and I hope I inspire people to um, look at the human body with less terror I think one of the things I do with my art is I try to get people who would usually back away from human organs to actually walk towards them. So I'm hoping anyone who listens to this will look at my work and they'll be less horrified from now on when they see the inside of the human body and perhaps they'll see more of the beauty that's in it. Yes. Yep, hope so too. All right, well, thank you, Kaz, and thanks to everyone for listening. Mm -hmm.